by just our many days. Should I sit down first? No, no, no. No? no I've never, yeah, I've been there 11 summers, but never winter, yeah. So I don't know if it's fun going there, but it certainly is exotic travel, which I'm a strong fan. Anyway, um, it, it's very, very appropriate that he be a uh, Steve Murray lecturer. Just as I described to you, he's not only expert with the observations, but he's also expert with the hardware, which is something that Steve Murray was also expert at, which he would have greatly appreciated. Uh, so his talk today is titled surveys of the cosmic microwave background and the scenario double vision effect in the South Pole Council, and I give you all right, thank you for the great introduction. Yeah, and also Steve obviously contributed a lot of valuable early GTO time to follow up some of the first SBT uh, discovered clusters. So we're also very appreciative of that. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to talk about so basically science with the South Pole Telescope, both cosmic wave background, a little bit of Sunel Zildovich focusing on the cluster science in particular, and sort of talk about you know where, where are we at, where are we, where are we where have we gone over the last decade of observations from the South Pole and where we're going, what's the next exciting uh, data set's going to bring, and then also where are we going in the future, pointing towards sort of this next uh, project, CMBS-4. Um, so uh, measurements of the CMB have really advanced a lot over the last decades, as, as many of you know. Just getting back to the first measurement of anisotropy from COBE, released in 1982. This is an all-sky map from COBE, so these fluctuations are 30 microkelvin RMS fluctuations on this sort of 3 Kelvin, roughly, black body uh, with sort of degree scale angular resolution. Since COBE, obviously, the measurements have improved a lot. Uh, just There's been two all-sky missions going from WMAP, which improved sensitivity and angular resolution, and uh, Planck again, uh, 2013 data, basically showing these fluctuations in the primordial universe with like increasing precision, accuracy of the measurement, and angular resolution. Um, so, however, typically we sort of uh, appreciate these measurements, understand these measurements in terms of the, uh, CMB angular power spectrum. So it's basically a spherical harmonic transform of that map, Fourier transform effectively. It's just showing the power in that map as a function of angular scale, where the first peak is at around L of 200, roughly degree scales, and then showing this sort of distinct harmonic pattern going to higher uh, L multiples or smaller angular resolution. So of course there's a ton of information encoded in this power spectrum is why we look at it this way. Both the amplitude tells us something about the initial conditions in the universe, the Geometry is told us by something of the, the shape of it, especially these peak heights and locations. And then the peak, well, I guess, heights, relative heights in particular, tells us something about, a lot about the content. So by measuring this, we're, of course, learning a lot about the conditions in the very early universe. And uh, so you look at sort of those progress in sort of CMB power spectrum as that maps, you really also really becomes clear sort of the improvement in measurement sensitivity. So this is a 2002 compilation of the CMB power spectrum you know, 10 years after Kobe, so Kobe would have been a single point basically on this plot. Now we're sort of starting to see the shape of this angular power spectrum uh, come into shape with the first peak at roughly L of 200. 
uh, you know, 10 years, so this is 10 years after Kobe, 10 years after that with WMAP and SBT, right before Planck, you can really start seeing this power spectrum take shape and the measure precision improving uh, dramatically in that 10 years. And if you do a compilation today, of course, with Planck, ACT, SBT, um, latest results, you get this uh, really impressive measurement of where these error bars are now um, extremely tight and with very high precision we see nine acoustic peaks in the temperature power spectrum. And what's maybe even more remarkable is that when you fit a lambda CDM cosmological model to this, you get a very good fit to a six parameter lambda CDM cosmological model and with this implies this sort of 60 sigma offset between the amount of baryons and cold dark matter. So, you know, the fact that we've measured things at this level, this level of precision, and it's sort of fit by such a simple model, is, you know, it's quite remarkable and really been, uh, you know, somewhat a well, happy surprise uh, as we've done these measurements. Uh, but of course, we know very soon that, uh, you know, six parameter lambda CDM model is not going to be enough to characterize this. Very soon we're going to need a seventh parameter at least, uh, neutrino mass, uh, to actually uh, fit the data really well. And you can see this even latest results from Planck. This is showing, you know, H naught versus the sum of neutrino masses, uh, where now we just have upper limits from the sum of the neutrino masses on cosmology. Uh, but, but depending on if you, uh, you know, what combination you use, whether it's Planck or Planck plus BAO, you know, we're at the level where we're getting sort of 100 to 200 milliEV level constraints on the sum of the neutrino masses, which is really close to this 60 milliEV known lower limit from, that we have from terrestrial oscillation experiment. So very soon, uh, you know, factor of two or three more sensitivity, we should be at the point where we actually need neutrino mass to characterize, uh, you know, the CMB data that we're seeing. Um, in addition, we know there's also these sort of interesting hints of new physics that we potentially have. You know, one of the most uh, talked about ones is this tension between the Hubble constant between local probes of measuring expansion in the nearby universe, comparing it to the CMB inferred H naught that you'd get assuming a lambda CMB cosmology. Um, right now, there's depending on you know what currently where we're at, but it's uh, sort of on the you know, on the order of about a five sigma tension. So it's you know it's certainly intriguing. Um, it's hard to say what's going on exactly. I'm not sure I would believe it's necessarily new physics at this point, but um, it's intriguing nonetheless. Um, especially early on, one of the, you know, one possibility to try to explain it is trying to do something to mess with the expansion rate of the very early universe. And one thing, especially a few years ago, that was really popular to try to explain it was uh, increasing this NF parameter. So this is the relativistic energy density, the effective number of relativistic species. It's, it's really effectively measuring the relativistic energy density of the universe, but sort of characterizing it in terms of this NF parameter, which is supposed to be three if there are three neutrino species. But in principle, if there were additional uh, light relic particles that formed thermally in the very early universe, it would also be a sensitive probe of that. Uh, the CMB allows uh, constraint on that. And, and you can see here, basically, there are constraints on NF are basically three, what we should expect from the neutrinos, plus or minus 10% uh, roughly at this point. But, you know, in principle, you know, by adding additional f physics in the early universe that changes the expansion rates, you can get things that sort of plays with the, or affects the inferred H naughts from the CMB that you know, in principle, could relieve that tension with uh, the local probes, although I don't think this one can go quite far enough. But, you know, in principle, there's sort of a, su a surprise, and as we make better measurements, you know, we could learn more and find other surprises. So, uh, you know, so even though we've made great progress in the CMB, there's still a lot to learn. And, it, you know, in part, it's just due to this unique nature of the CMB itself, where it allows you to probe back to the very earliest fraction of a second, that period of inflation that we expect to happen, all the th way through nucleosynthesis, and then so that even uh, when that light was emitted from the CMB 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that light had to travel across the entire observable universe to get to us and probing evolution at, of the universe over that point. So in principle, the CMB is really a great way to learn about, you know, there's still many ways that we can use the CMB to test different epochs of the universe. You know, one, to test whether this period of inflation happened, and if so, what energy scale was the physics responsible for it. Um, you know, mainly we're doing that through the CMB polarization, and I'll talk more about that as we go here. Um, neutrinos to, to actually better constrain this amount of relativistic uh, density in the universe, and in particular try to rule out any the existence of any other light red particles that may have been thermally generated in the very early universe. Um, and then, of course, um, either through this, these structure probes uh, from the surface of last scattering, by measuring the structure through either CMB lensing or the Sineo Zobovich effect allows us to get constraints on some of the neutrino masses or, or dark energy, things that affect structure growth over time. So there's still a lot of ways where the CMB is really sort of connected to fundamental physics throughout the whole history.
uh, of the universe. Um, and, and the next frontier for improving the measurements of the CMB are really uh, looking towards polarization. So up to now, I've really only been talking about temperature anisotropies. But of course, we know that the same uh, uh, perturbations in the very early universe will generate uh, an E-mode polarization pattern and a, a similar sort of distinct harmonic structure to the E-mode polarization power spectrum. And then, um, in addition, that large-scale structure can generate B-modes. And in terms of measurement precision, uh, measurements of CMB polarization are roughly a decade behind those of temperature. So we know we have a lot. But in principle, um, there's even more inf cosmological information just from a statistical perspective of relative constraint power and lambda standing parameters. There's potentially more constraining power in the polarization than there is in temperature even. And by improving our measurements sort of in different regions of this parameter space, you know, you know, here at Harvard especially is this connection to the bicep Keck experiment where they're looking for this low L polarization signal from inflationary gravity waves. By making measurements, better measurements there, we better constrain those parameters. By making better measurements at high L, sort of few arc minute scale, we can start uh, putting better constraints on these other parameters related to this light relativistic particle species. Uh, spectral inflation or neutrino mass or dark energy. So we know by making better measurements, we can connect the sort of observables to this physics in this sort of uh, predictable way. Um, well, all, so all, all these advances in the last decades in CMB measurement or observations have really been driven by advances in detector technology. And for the last 20 years, really, the, the way that we've advanced the sensitivity of the experiments has really been driven by making more detectors, uh, fitting more detectors in focal plane. So even 20 years ago, sort of a state-of-the-art focal plane had on the order of 10 or 20 detectors. And even the last uh, you know, 15 years since then, uh, SPT3G right now is the most detectors in any sort of CMB focal plane, which is about 16,000 detectors. So over 15 years period, we basically increased the number of detectors by about 1,000, which to zeroth order increases the mapping speed by a factor of 1,000. And, uh, you know, uh, we're trying to take the next leap right now by building this st stage four CMB experiment, which has on the order of half a million detectors. So just by making uh, ever more sensitive instruments, we can do that by making ever more sensitive focal planes that have more detectors. And that's been really the, the, the drive in technology over the last 20 years. But we, you know, now we can do it. We think we know how to do it. It's just a matter of scaling it up to something that, uh, on a somewhat larger scale than we've done, but, or a magnitude larger scale than we've done before. So, uh, and what's... Uh, Exciting is you can connect a lot of this new physics that I've been talking about it, relative to inflation, these constraints on light relativistic species, the neutrino mass. You can connect that pretty directly to um, the mapping speed of different experiments, in particular this detector count, going from a stage two experiment has over 1,000 detectors, a stage three experiment has over 10,000, and then the stage four CMBS4 experiment would have about over half a million detectors. As you increase the number of detectors, you can see how a lot of these key metrics and these key observables connected to this physics uh, just sort of keep on uh, going down, where for something like inflation, for example, we could, compared to the constraints today, we can still improve the constraints going to stage four by a factor of 100 to relative to what the constraints are today, um, and a factor of several over what we expect to get from stage three. So, you know, by making these more sensitive experiments, we can kind of clearly uh, improve on a lot of these sort of parameters connected to fundamental physics. So, um, yeah, so... I'm going to transition a little bit to talk here. So a lot of our science is really motivated by this fundamental physics, but I'm going to talk a little more about sort of connection to a lot of our surveys for SB South Pole Telescope, and you also start appreciating sort of how the connections to astrophysics and astronomy. So, um, so this is SBT. It's a 10-meter, uh, millimeter wavelength telescope at the South Pole. Um, it's mainly focused in three observing bands centered around the peak of the CMB black body at 150 gigahertz, but... So 100, 150, 200 gigahertz is our, our sweet spot, but it, in principle, is a sub-millimeter quality telescope. So with a 10-meter dish, um, you get on order of a sort of arc-minute angular resolution at these frequencies. Um, and it's, we've actually just finished our 13th uh, winter observing season, and which we've sort of gradually relied on this sort of improvements in detecting technology to make better cameras, going from the original SPTSZ camera, which had on order of 1,000 detectors, to today, uh, the SPT3G camera, which has 16,000 detectors. Um, and roughly the scale. And I'll talk a little bit more about the detectors uh, later. Um, but the unique thing really about the SBT is that it's the biggest, largest diameter telescope of its kind doing these observations of the CMB, so that big telescopes gives you small angular resolution to really look for these high L, uh, you know, arc minute scale features in the CMB, and also to use that for astronomy. And I'll sort of demonstrate that in the coming slides. 
So uh, you know, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about is really you know, the cumulative effort of this entire SBT collaboration, which is sort of on the order of 100 scientists across many institutions. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm going to try to acknowledge people on specific efforts where I can, but it's really this sort of cumulative effort of a lot of people, both instrumentalists and uh, astronomers, sort of banning the whole range. So um, one thing about the SBT or South Pole is that it's really the best place in the world to do observations of the cosmic microwave background, just the unique conditions there. Um, so when we're observing in these sort of wave bands around 2 millimeter, 150 gigahertz wavelength, uh, you're trying to observe in these atmospheric windows, and water vapor is really important to the transmission. So one thing that's unique about the S South Pole is that it's extremely dry. Once air gets so cold at the South Pole, um, literally water vapor freezes out of the atmosphere, turns into ice crystals, and makes the South Pole technically a desert. So if you measure the sort of quality of the atmosphere in terms of the precipitable water vapor in the wintertime, it's a factor of several less uh, than Chile or Hawaii. So there's just much less water vapor. Um, in addition, once the sun sets for the austral winter, it's down for six months, and so you don't have that daily turbulence from the sort of turning of the atmosphere from the rising and setting of the sun. So if you were to measure the stability of the atmosphere, so how much the atmospheric power fluctuates on sort of degree angular scales, it's about a factor of 30 more stable than Chile. So the atmosphere is just much more stable and so for this degree scale, millimeter wavelength emission, that sort of is important for confusing our CMB measurements. It's a much more stable site than anywhere else in the world, except you know, other high places and nearby places in Antarctica. So for the SBT, uh, we've been observing for 13 years now um, with these three different cameras doing various surveys. Um, so in total, we've surveyed about 5,200 square degrees to Planck sensitivity, Planck depths, or better, so deeper. Um, sort of outlined here. So yellow here is the main SPTSZ survey, which uh, was the first survey we did of 2,500 square degrees, which a lot of the Chandra observations that we've done with SPT have been based on that data so far. Um, SPT poll went even further north to observe another 2,700 square degrees. And then we've done a sort of wedding cake survey where we've gone uh, deeper and deeper with SPT poll and now going to SPT 3G. So uh, eventually when we'll get to it, I'll talk more about 3G. The unique thing about the new thing about the South Pole and the new thing about South Pole right now, SPT 3G, is that even though we're observing sort of on the order of a couple thousand square degrees, similar area to SPT SZ originally, we're going to go about a factor of 10 times deeper. So that's really important for this, these sensitive measurements, the, the CMB polarization, but also the high redshift universe, as you'll, as you'll appreciate as we go on here. Um, so in, even though I've motivated most of my talk by this sort of fundamental physics, CMB-based uh, science constraints, if you actually look at the publications and the citations sort of across all the SBT publications uh, and break it into sort of categories of the sort of CMB anisotropy, CMB lensing, Sandevich effect, galaxy cluster, astronomical follow-up, high redshift galaxies, even the Event Horizon Telescope we participate in, um, roughly half our publications are really astronomy based on similar galaxies or galaxy clusters. And I mean, that's, I think, one thing that often surprises a lot of CMB people is that, you know, even though we're sort of CMB focused in how we have designed a lot of our surveys, really with this arc minute scale resolution, you can do a lot of astronomy in a unique way from these sort of unique, it's a new wavelength regime for millimeter, millimeter wavelength astronomy, doing these large surveys down to these depths. You can get a lot of interesting science. So just to sort of help demonstrate that, if you sort of now look at this all-sky map and then just focus in a small patch. Uh, so this is a roughly 50 square degree patch as observed by Planck. So this is Planck, actual real Planck data. And then sort of uh, transition to see how this looks with SBT. You know, this is what you would find. So, so basically, that big telescope, 10 meter telescopes, gives you roughly six times better angular resolution than, than uh, Planck. So that's what makes these things like these dark spots and bright spots just pop out of the map. It's like putting on a pair of glasses where it sort of comes into focus and all that, that structure appears. Uh, but in addition, you'd sort of notice these large-scale features. That is uh, primor primordials, primary CMB and isotropy that we're really just measuring at very high signal to noise. So that's not noise in the map. That's fluctuations in the very early universe that we're just measuring at very high signal to noise uh, commonly between Planck and SBT. So those are fluctuations on tens of arc minute scales, basically. Um, you can sort of filter this uh, data and then sort of zoom in on some of these dark spots. So originally, the main reason we built SBT, motiva you know, and it was recommended to be built in the Astro 2000 Decadal Report. Um, the reason it was originally motivated was 
by doing a survey for clusters of galaxies, looking for these dark spots in the map, these shadows caused by Seneyev's Zodovchik fact, where there, as seen be photons pass through a hot cluster of galaxies, you know, for a massive one, roughly 1% 1 of the photons scatter, uh, and on average gain energy, causing a spectral distortion uh, in, the, in the direction of that cluster. And the unique thing about the Seneyev's Zodovchik fact is that it's a spectral distortion, so as you go back in time, uh, go back higher redshift, there are more CMB photons, the density of CMB photons is hotter, so there's more, or higher, so there's more photons to scatter off that cluster. So it turns out the red it's a, basically a redshift independent effect. So a, a cluster of a given mass at high redshift has the same sp surface brightness as a cluster at low redshift. So it's a, and you know, since the CMB has had to travel across the entire universe, it's an efficient way to really find these most distant uh, clusters of galaxies, the earliest ones that formed in the universe. And, uh, you know, watching it from my perspective, you've really seen this sort of amazing growth in the industry for the cluster surveys over the last decade. So the first SD discovered cluster was published in 2008 uh, by SBT. But since then, um, you know, many of these are unpublished as well, but there are over 3,000 now SD identified clusters from the combined SBT Planck and Atacama Cosmology Telescope experiments. And if you look at a plot of mass versus redshift, you can see you know, what makes this SC selection so unique. So black here, this is now from five years ago, uh, but uh, summary at the time of the SBTSZ sample, the black points, uh, Atacama Cosmology Telescope in green. What you see is this mass selection that's sort of slightly falling with redshift. So even though, um, and we're, we're getting that both because of the SZ effect and also the small beam. You need sort of an arc minute, roughly cluster scale size beam to actually resolve the cluster. But what you can see is that, you know, effectively we're in this unique parameter space where we're really in a new way finding clusters at high redshifts that are, are being missed from other surveys that rely on some sort of emission mechanism like x-rays or optical. Um, so um, it's a unique way to find these high redshift clusters. Um, and then it's also a relatively clean measure of the cluster mass um, that the, the integrated SZ signal is meant to have a, a low scatter proxy for cluster mass, sort of on the order of tens of... 10% or 20%. Um, so it's also been made these SC cluster surveys useful co for cosmology. And so on the right here, you see a plot of number counts of clusters with redshift, uh, you know, both uh, cumulative and then also relative to lambda CM cosmology. And so we've also used that abundance of clusters and that evolution of the abundance to put constraints on cosmological parameters, sigma 8, omega matter. Uh, blue here is SBT. Green is another X-ray survey, Wayne the Giants. Uh, uh, orange and red are uh, optical lensing shear surveys from DES and KIDS. Uh, but you can see basically, and then gray here is Planck. And so what you can see is basically you're getting sort of comparable constraints uh, from all these different probes of structure, clusters, lensing. Um, and then also I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, just how it, generally they do find a little bit less structure than what would be inferred from the Planck data set. But you can do cosmology with this cluster abundance that you measure. Um, so what I think in some ways I would say, though, that the, the sort of the, what's been learned from the astrophysics side of doing follow-up of these clusters is actually one of the unique, uh, you know, high-impact uh, uh, deliverables from the SBT survey. And here in particular, you're probably most familiar with a lot of the X-ray follow-up. So in total, uh, so we're just by providing this sort of unique sample of sort of 10 to the 14, 10 to the, a few times 10 to the 14 solar mass clusters at really high redshift, especially above redshift 1. Um, so far, actually, there's been about 100 SBTSC selected clusters followed up by Chandra with the highest one out at redshift 1.85 uh, so, so far. So it's really been able to sort of probe cluster formation and evolution out to these unique redshifts that have so far uh, been inaccessible to us. Um, in addition, you know, these surveys have been really great at finding these you know, sort of unique clusters in this sort of evolutionary standpoint of, you know, one of the most famous ones is the Phoenix cluster. This uh, you know, most X-ray luminous cluster known in the universe at redshift 0.6 uh, with this sort of cooling flow at the center and this BCG with this unusual burst uh, of star formation and sort of then identifying these unique objects in the SZ surveys and then this detailed follow-up to learn about the astrophysics has been one unique aspect. Um, and then in, I'm not going to talk much about this. This is a slide from Mike McDonald over at MIT, but, uh, you know, just putting able to put, use the X-ray data and put constraints on cool core evolution, morphology evolution, metallicity, uh, AGN growth over time. You know, it's really been helping to sort of probe this unique region 
well, redshift 0.5 or so and from these cleanly selected samples. And to, to basically, you know, so as far as we can tell, uh, sort of consistent with this picture of clusters evolving uh, self-similarly over time. Um, so in terms of like of where we're going in the future for a lot of these SE surveys, I think one place that SBT is really focusing on is really trying to push out to higher redshifts and expand these high redshift samples. And you can see one example of that from this recent paper that came out uh, from this SBT poll 100D deep surveys. This is a survey that's roughly a factor of four times deeper than SBTSZ. Uh, this is sort of the chain that's shown characteristic mass versus redshift plot. Uh, red are the SBT poll point. So it's only 100 square degrees, but it, since it's so, so deeper, um, the mass limit is a factor of a couple less, uh, such that you know, we're, as you go deeper, you're finding more, you know, lower mass clusters. So there's roughly one cluster per square degree uh, in this survey versus roughly 0.2 clusters per square degree from SBTSC. So we're a you know, factor of five higher cluster density by going deeper in this example. Um, and then as you go deeper, a higher percentage of those clusters will also be at high redshift. For SBT poll, th this survey, there's about 20% of the clusters are above redshift one. So as we find more clusters, we're getting, lowering this mass threshold and sort of naturally probing this, finding lower mass clusters that are forming at earlier times. Another unique thing about this uh, 100D survey is that we've just sort of designed it from the ground up to focus on a deep patch early on in SBT poll and get a lot of overlapping surveys at other wave bands. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Herschel is overlapping 100 square degree Herschel sp survey, Spitzer, ATCA. Um, it overlaps one of the southern XMM XXL field. Uh, in addition, we have a, a few different Chandra programs targeting subsets of the clusters in this field, particularly focusing on the high redshift end. So there's this uh, large program last year, well, a few years ago now, from Mike McDonald, uh, focusing at 0.8 to redshift 0.8 to 1.4 basically trying to do x-ray, shallow x-ray observations of the progenitors of sort of 10 to the 15 solar mass systems locally, trying to observe the progenitors at redshift one and to characterize their evolution in their sample. So it's sort of unique ways to get pictures of this, uh, these high redshift progenitors to massive clusters to see how they've been evolving. Um, in addition, last year we published this SPT ECS extended cluster survey sample, which was this shallow 2,700 square degrees we observed with SPT poll, uh, which uh, expand. You know, red here is SPT poll, so mass with redshift again. S red's SPT poll, black is the old SPT SZ. So it's a very similar cluster sample in terms of cluster density and counts at, to, between SPT ECS and SPT SZ originally. So uh, once you add in, you know, the three samples together. Now we have in the literature over 1,000 clusters, uh, SBT identified clusters in the literature between the three different surveys. And then once you do a cross-matching of this data with DES, it increases the number uh, by quite a bit. So we're at the point now where we're having sort of 1,000 cluster you know, SZ samples from Planck, SBT, and then there's an unpublished uh, ACT sample of, of sort of similar size as well. That's coming out, I, I hear, very soon. All right. So. Um, in addition, you know, when you go back to this SBT map and look at this sort of lightly filtered map, uh, there's a whole industry of actually following up uh, the brightest emissive sources in the map. And I'm sure actually there's probably people in the room that could tell me more about this uh, than not, not quite what I work on. But uh, it's, it's also been a, a unique source for understanding galaxy formation. In particular, uh, when you look at these objects, since we have three bands, you can characterize them as radio bright or dust bright. And in particular, if you focus on the dust bright sources that don't overlap with any nearby IRAS or infrared survey, generally those high red shifts, uh, generally those dusty objects that don't match with local pro, uh, surveys, those tend to be high red shift dusty galaxies that are gravitationally lensed and magnified, the brightest of them. And those are great candidates to follow up with ALMA in particular to study the morphology to understand the sample and understand the astrochemistry of those, clusters, those galaxies. Um, and part of the reason I highlight this is in the next couple weeks, we should have a new uh, point source catalog coming out from SBT, S SBT SC from this original 2,500 square degree survey, actually, which hasn't been completely released, but that has 5,000 sources in total. About 850 of them are dust dominated. And 500 of these, uh, which should contain 500 sources that we expect to be high redshift a lens, dusty star forming galaxy. So this is a plot of a uh, number counts versus 220 gigahertz flux here. You can break out the components into different based on their uh, spectra. And basically this red component here is the number of objects that we find that are strongly lensed 
uh, star forming galaxies, high redshift galaxies that are strongly lensed. So, um, you know, even, you know, as, as we've been making this catalog, a lot of the team on the galaxy formation side has really been focused on, oh, yeah. So, one, the thing that's unique about these objects, particular, um, you know, in a different way, but similar to the SZ, um, it's also a really, by finding these galaxies in the millimeter wavelengths, um, it's a really efficient way to find the highest redshift galaxies, just to, due to this, uh, you know, cute fact. If you look at a dusty SED, galaxy SED uh, for sort of redshift, you know, nearby, 0.1 galaxy here, as that galaxy moves further away and is redshifted, that the peak of the SED moves into the SPT bands, and so you can redshift that SED, uh, you know, out to redshift 4, and if you look at the SPT bands around, you know, a couple millimeter wavelength, basically that galaxy is the same brightness. Um, so it, it creates this sort of redshift independent selection effect by selecting these bright, dusty objects on their millimeter wavelength emission that is efficient to try to find, find galaxies out to even redshift, you know, nine and potentially. So, um, you know, as I said, there's been a lot of detailed follow-up of these objects with ALMA, trying to characterize the morphology, this lensing aspect. There's been a lot of stunning pictures of this gravitational lensing, uh, you know, stunning data about showing, identifying spectral lines and redshifts of these galaxies with ALMA. Um, but in particular, um, you know, highlighting a couple examples, you know, the highest redshift galaxy we found thus far from the sample is redshift 6.9, right? So it's a, it's a two massive galaxies colliding um, that we can observe with ALMA and study spectroscopically. Um, in addition, one of these objects, uh, just flashing through here, um, was this protocluster at redshift 4.3. So when you observed it with ALMA, you could see that the SZ emission was broken up into multiple objects, which eventually they got spectral measurements for. And from those, uh, those spectral measurements with ALMA, they could get a velocity dispersion that estimated a mass of this thing at 10 to 13 solar masses at redshift 4.3. So something that would be you know, pretty unique in terms of protocluster formation. Uh, but you know, one of the reasons I highlighted is, um, is that the fact that these you know, CMB SZ surveys are actually able to probe cluster formation from the SZ effect out to redshift 2 from the SZ emission. But even in looking for protoclusters at higher redshift before gas is virilized, actually selecting these galaxies by the millimeter wave like emission is a, a really interesting sample of study sort of massive galaxy formation and protocluster formation in these really large wide field surveys to select the rarest of these objects and identify them over the whole epic of cluster formation. Um, and in one new area that I think you'll start seeing more and more of, especially from the South Pole, is this sort of look, search for millimeter wavelength transients. And a few years ago, we've had the first limits on millimeter wavelength transients uh, in this Whitehorn et al. paper. So we did detect one uh, 15 milijansky candidate that burst, flared up after, for a few days and then dimmed um, that was sort of uh, you know, measured at low significance. Like when you look at the maps like this, it looks pretty significant, but if you just sort of do the statistics of the sort of random uh, false associations, noise fluctuations that might mirror something like this. The probability this is a real source, uh, well, it's, uh, the PTE was about 0 0.01. So, you know, it was a pretty good fit to uh, something that you might have randomly seen, but it was sort of two sigma statistically significant in terms of a source. Uh, but as, as we take deeper data, as we use SPT poll, and then also 3G, which is over order of magnitude more sensitive, you know, we should be 10 times more sensitive to these wavelength transients. So in particular, there's some interest in trying to, there's some thought this is an efficient way to find orphan gamma ray bursts, gamma ray bursts that aren't beamed in our direction that are dust obscured. But you know, I think you'll really start seeing some interesting constraints for the next few years of uh, CMB, SBT limits on sort of millimeter wavelength transients and, and gamma ray bursts models. All right. so. You know, I've talked a little bit about asterisks now, so let's back a little bit to the focusing on the sort of large scale fluctuations, the CMB anisotropy. Um, what, so two things, you know, as I said earlier, that I set up, you know, one, one place that we expect the next frontier for CMB is sort of improved constraints on cosmology from the EMO, CMB polarization. Um, and thus far, the best ground-based measurement of the EMO polarization is from SBT pool, this 500 square degree field. So it was, you know, uh, it was, so it's only about a percent of the sky, but it's observed to roughly, you know, roughly a factor of uh, several times deeper than, than uh, Planck, as I said earlier. So this is what that E-mode map looks like. You can take a power spectrum of this, both, this is showing the TE cross spectrum, 
So correlation between the temperature and E-mode polarization, which again shows this sort of characteristic uh, uh, harmonic pattern. So basically at roughly L greater than 1500, SPT pole has the current best constraints. At this is showing a compilation of several experiments. Below L, 1500, Planck has the best constraints. Um, and where SPT pole is limited by sample variance over most of our L range. Um, and then it's showing the E-mode power spectrum, where now since E-modes are a little, you know, it uh, needs deeper data to see them, uh, SPT pole basically has the best measurements above L of 1,000, even better than Planck, already on this sort of damping tail part of the E-mode spectrum. So one, uh, so one thing that sort of, this, is a, this all came out in Henny et al. from a few years ago now, uh, one thing that was interesting about this result, though, and I think points towards the future a little bit, is just sort of uh, using this CMB polarization cosmos constraints as a consistency check with the temperature-based constraints, um, since it's sort of probing, potentially probing different physics and is less sensitive to foregrounds and other instrumental effects. So one thing that came up in this SBT poll uh, results was this plot, what I'm emphasizing here is this plot of sigma-8 versus the cold uh, dark matter density and then H naught here, where, where gold is uh, Planck, gray is SBT pole, um, and then blue and red is when you break the SBT pole data into high, or low L and high L. So what you see here is that uh, SBT pole is sort of pulled away from Planck in this interesting way. You know, it favors a little bit smaller sigma 8 if you're going from Planck, which is this 0.83 level, SBT pole is at 0.77. Uh, the H naught for SBT pole is a little bit higher, 71 versus Planck, 67. Technically, this is only you know, roughly two sigma uh, inconsistent, so you know, not that unexpected. Uh, but one thing that was interesting that came out of it is that, uh, one of the things that was interesting that came out of it was that this shift in parameters uh, from SPT pole was really driven by information at high L in that region of the power spectrum that SPT pole measures better um, at high L, which is also more sensitive to lensing information, so the gravitational lensing of the CMB from large scale structure. And both of those things were basically pulling uh, pretty strongly in this way of less structure, uh, basically, and then a higher higher H naught. So you know, as part of this, you know, story of uh, trying to understand where this tension in local probes versus uh, the CMB comes from, you know, having these consistency checks and sort of ability to test different models. If you want to explain this by physics, by looking at E mode polarization versus temperature, become more and more uh, important. So you can also use that map to create a lensing reconstruction. And so this is now a, 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 a lensing convergence map of the CMB, sort of made from that uh, same data. But this is now that, say, 500 square degrees. These are sort of degree scale fluctuations in the matter density. So this is what you'd reconstruct as the line of sight uh, structure uh, in the map from just looking for higher order distortions and correlations in the CMB measurements. And so this was uh, presented in, in Wu et al. last year uh, from SBT poll. Uh, if you look at the power spectrum, so this is the lensing power spectrum. Uh, orange is S Planck, purple is SBT. Uh, one thing that's interesting right at the bat is you get roughly a, uh, from just only 1% of the sky, you get a 4% constraint on structure, this sort of sigma 8 omega matter parameter to the 0.25 compared to Planck's 3% constraint. So even though we're only surveying 1% of the sky versus Planck's all sky, uh, by just getting this really deep data in principle, you can get pretty similar constraints on cosmos parameters uh, from this lensing information. It's sort of characterizing the amplitude of this lensing power spectrum, basically. Um, in addition, uh, one thing that's really interesting is by going deeper is you're getting more and more of that lensing information from the polarization, sort of as this sort of systematic check as well. So Planck's all sky lensing measurement is dominated almost exclusively by the temperature information. So it's really a measurement of the lensing from uh, CMB temperature uh, correlations. Uh, but with, once you get down to the depth of SBT pole and deeper, there's more and more, and eventually more information comes from the lensing or the polarization components. Um, and so this is showing that same lensing power spectrum now broken out into you know, the sort of co-added minimum variance uh, black points, and then also one cyan points that are from polarization alone. Uh, red is temperature polarization. And you can characterize the amplitude of that uh, signal relative to what you'd expect given the Planck cosmology, right? So you'd expect this to be one if it's if this measurement is consistent with the Planck cosmology, or you know if it's less than one, that basically indicates there's a little less structure measured in the lensing map than inferred from the Planck cosmology. 
And you basically see sort of this consistent picture that you know we're basically consistent with Lambda CDM, but although tend to be a little bit low in terms of our structure probes, and we're low both in the polarization and temperature measure of this uh, lensing. So, yeah. So you know, sort of, sort of taken in unison. So if you sort of think about all, all the story that I've told of uh, of uh, you know these different lensing. So this is showing again the sigma eight versus the mega matter plot where. This tight black contour here, here is from Planck temperature. Uh, uh, purple here is actually Planck lensing. Uh, red is, S oh, uh, black is SBT, SZ lensing. Uh, and then uh, gray and pink here are these two optical surveys, KIDS and DES. But what's interesting is like all sort of consistently, a lot of these probes of lensing, either from CMB or optical or even probes of structure from clusters, um, all sort of points to generally lower structure than observed from Planck uh, TT. And so this is sort of a consistent theme. If you fit this a lensing parameter for Planck, they get a value of roughly three sigma high above a sort of lambda seeding prediction. So something in the Planck temperature data has sort of consistently been driving the, the amount of structure constraints high. And what you see is a lot of other probes of structure from, from the higher order lensing correlations or optical or clusters generally finds lower stru structure. So you know, what's, you know, causing this exactly? Will this hold up? You know, I think everything is sort of at this, um, you know, two sigma level for when you compare any individual set of measurements. But the fact that all of them sort of line up in a similar way, sort of interesting at least, um, and sort of potentially exciting um, as something that we want to sort of probe and study better with better measurements. So, uh, you know, part of that is sort of the motivation for this sort of next generation SBT 3G camera as well. So the 16,000 capture camera here, so picture of the team uh, in front of the telescope right after we installed it, uh, the camera on the telescope. Um, it's a, so it's a three color camera, so it makes simultaneous observations at 95, 150, and 220 hertz for each pixel. And in total, there are about 16,000 detectors. And so if you look, zoom in on a detector, it sort of looks like this. They're uh, detectors patterned on silicon wafers where this is a planar uh, broadband antenna that's patterned into a uh, niobium ground plane where you know, light will sort of three millimeter diameter. So millimeter wave light comes in, excites currents along the arms of the antenna. Um, those currents move along these microstrip that go down to these detectors, these de uh, transition and sensor detectors on the side. So each pixel has uh, three colors and two polarizations. So it's measuring a Y polarization, X polarization, and three colors. And if you were to zoom in on one of these detectors here, it consists of this sort of 100 micron scale island uh, with this uh, titanium gold transition head sensor uh, at the center, which operates has a transition temperature around half a Kelvin. So this whole, you know, so this whole thing is a, you know, it's multi truck a pixel, and then it has to be cooled to about 0.3 degrees. And SBT 3G has about 16,000 of these TES detectors. And so here's a picture of the whole team now with uh, oh, their red parkas on uh, inside the, the building, sort of in the, the fully assembled focal plane, which has the most detectors of its kind uh, observing right now. So you know, what's going to be exciting about this, as I said earlier, is the fact that with SBT3G, we'll observe this 1500 square degree patch about 10 times deeper than we've currently observed so far with SBTSZ. And as I'll, I'll bring up here, it also We've optimized our, or designed our survey to overlap with the BICEP array and BICEP KEK experiments to try to do a joint CMB analysis with them to go after uh, improve inflationary uh, constraints, um, as I'll, I'll describe here. So, and just to give you an idea of the sensitivity, so this is the one, our 1500 square degree patch. And basically, in five days, roughly, uh, we observed this 1500 square degree patch to Planck depth in about five days of data. And we reobserved that patch every two days. And we're basically planning to reach that patch for the next six years to basically do this long exposure integration to get down the depth to this level where we're roughly, you know, on the order of 30 times deeper than Planck eventually. So even from the first couple months of data that we took in 2018, uh, this is showing an E-mode power spectrum from SBT3G, this 1500 square degree data. So already even with a couple months of data, um, this would be the best constraint on the E-mode power spectrum in this sort of 1700 to 17, 700 to 1700 range. So a way to sort of improve our constraints to really sort of test consistencies of cosmological models, improve the SBT-based uh, E-mode constraints as a consistency test with Planck. 
Uh, but in addition, like one of the main things we're really excited about is sort of this overlapping uh, B mode constraints with bicep uh, CAC. And so this is showing sort of a summary of the bicep CAC program. So of course, bicep two got famous from its uh, bicep two observations, which ended in 2012. Uh, but they continu continued on uh, making ever more sensitive cameras, much like we have, from the Keck array, which just stopped observing last year, Bicep 3, which deployed several years ago now, and then Bicep array, which just deployed to the South Pole this austral summer. Um, they've been increasing the amount of frequency bands, increasing the number of detectors, and you know, already I would say they're an order of magnitude, have the best R constraints by an order of magnitude. But uh, as they move forward, it, the, the pairing of them with a high resolution experiment like SBT improves you know, everyone's constraints, basically. So you know, BICEP has a real, CAC has a real strong uh, uh, presence here in the Harvard, Boston area. Um, when the PI is, John Kovac is here, and Marion is here from Boston, Harvard as well. Um, more recently, we've formed this South Pole Observatory collaborations to try to formalize the SBT and BICEP collaborations uh, working together to do this joint analysis and also to plan for the next generation's experiment at the South Pole. Uh, this, and we had our inaugural workshop last year. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is most exciting is this sort of improvement in the constraints on sigma r over time uh, for SPO, the South Pole Observatory between Bice SBT and BICEP. So right now, the constraints on sigma r are sort of on the order of 0.03 um, with uh, Thing with, as BICEP gets deeper, they sort of become limited by this lensing foreground signal to the B modes, which is how SBT3G helps uh, to improve the constraints. So by the end of uh, 2023 with SBT and BICEP, you should get down to this level of sigma r, you know, near, near approaching 0 0.002, which is basically a little over order of magnitude better than what we were doing today. So this should really be, you know, continue to be leading the constraints. You know, this is now with experiments in the field, taking data, this should continue to sort of push and lead uh, constraints on the sigma r parameter related to this B mode signal. Um, in addition, especially with the SBT data, as you go to higher L, you'll start really making improvements on these E mode and B mode parameters and such that, you know, this is showing relative improvement. I usually try to highlight that here, but it's basically at, at uh, L's above uh, 2,000 or so, there's really factors of several improvements um, in this constraints on this power spectrum, sort of in this region of parameter space and the and measurement space, uh, where you're really getting better handles on these parameters related to the damping tail, the CMB power spectrum. And uh, just to highlight a couple things, uh, so for a parameter like NF, uh, this n effective number of relative species, we should improve constraints on Planck by roughly a factor of two. Um, you know, still roughly a little bit more than factor two uh, away from what CMBS4 could do, but making gradual improvements. And then for neutrino mass, uh, you get constraints on sigma eight and neutrino mass from both clusters and CMB lensing as a consistency check. But basically with SBT3G, Planck, and uh, DESI BAL, you get down to sort of, expect to get down to roughly 38, 40 milliEV constraints in the next few years. Well, by the end of the survey, I guess. Um, for clusters, uh, the deep data, I think, actually helps a lot in, in terms of how you're pushing to higher redshift. So this is showing now this mass versus redshift plot for a simulated SPT3G sample. So that 10 times lower data changes to about a roughly three times lower mass limit. So now we should be finding on the order of four clusters per square degree. You know, rather, we started at 0.2 clusters per square degree with SPTSZ. We should increase that by a factor of 20 uh, for 3G. Um, and it's at the point where we expect um, roughly, you know, we, as we get deeper, higher fraction of those clusters will be at high redshift. So roughly 20% will be at redshift one. And such that roughly 1,000 of these clusters discovered by SBT3G should be at red, above redshift one. And we really should start finding clusters now above redshift two, where you're really starting to probe a new region and cluster evolution. Um, similarly, for Galaxy, high Z redshift galaxies and proto-clusters, you know, this deeper data will also help there. So this is showing number of objects above a certain redshift for SBTSZ going to SBT3G. So you basically, above redshift, uh, you should be able to find, you know, in principle, uh, proto-galaxies out to redshift nine, potentially even. And just from scaling the number counts from what we found over SBTSZ, you know, we found already one, at least one galaxy above redshift six. We should find 100, uh, at least in the sample from SBT3G. And even proto-clusters, we should find order of 100 above redshift four. So it's really, 
cool uh, way that you know, the CMB surveys are actually allowing you to probe galaxy and cluster evolution, you know, all the way out to protoclusters at, at very high redshifts. Um, and then sort of looking forward, uh, you know, going to CMBS4, I, you know, this is sort of comparing sort of uh, evolution of the projects at the South Pole and Chile. So the CMBS4 is eventually trying to plan a, a dual site survey using both South Pole emphasized, emphasizing these sort of deep observations in Chile to focus on these larger uh, all sky or yeah, larger fractions of sky uh, surveys. So right now at, at the South Pole, we have SPT3G and Bicep Array observing now eventually uh, in the next couple of years to get to this point where we have on over 50,000 detectors. Simon's Observatory is eventually coming along, which provide capability to upfit about 60,000 detectors. And we're hoping to use this infrastructure to build on and, and make CMBS4 happen. And in the meantime, after even after SPT3G is done observing in 2023, we're really aiming to try to get a new wide field survey telescope uh, built at the South Pole. Because right now, we're basically filled the SPT focal plane as much as the optics will allow, which is sort of limiting us on the order of 20,000 detectors. And so to get this sort of 100,000 detectors that we need for CMBS4, we need a new telescope design. So one thing we're, we're pushing uh, to get built in that sort of window uh, starting in 2024, is this South Pole uh, TMA, this three mirror and a stigmat design. So an, a TMA design is sort of a generic, you know, three mirror design so it can correct for all the major forms of optical aberration, you know, much like, you know, ELSA's T, JWS T is a TMA like design. But uh, so we're basically trying to apply those techniques to get wide field uh, cameras and optics to uh, the CMB experiment. So, so the TMA has about a 100 square degree field of view. Um, so, you know, roughly a factor of 20 better than SBT, uh, such that you could fit on the order of 400,000 one millimeter detectors in the TMA field of view. So it's designed to try to provide this platform where you could build a camera that has, could fit a couple hundred thousand detectors, but with arc minute angular resolution um, at the South Pole. So we're pushing that engineering design hoping to get funding for it to try to build that uh, starting in roughly 2024. Um, and then eventually have that fit into this sort of grander concept for the CMBS-4, which would have a combination of large aperture and small aperture telescopes, much like we're trying to do with SBO, South Pole Observatory, but scaled up to have on order of half a million detectors, uh, where we have these sort of large uh, aperture cameras in Chile and the South Pole, for alchemical angular scales, and then a small aperture telescopes at the South Pole looking for this B-mode polarization signal. So, you know, and ultimately sort of connected to all the physics of really sort of getting down to the point where on inflation we can improve constraints in order of magnitude where we are today, to get down and really test this uh, prediction of uh, three, you know, neutrino species and really rule out uh, any thermally generated light particles during the early universe and then ultimately try to detect neutrino mass. And we think, you know, there's sort of a clear path uh, to getting there, just building off our stage three uh, experiments. All right, so I'll sort of end it there. So, you know, and I'll, so, you know I, I think right now it's a really exciting time for CMB. You know, the last decade we've really sort of demonstrated uh, how we were able to find these unique uh, catalogs of high redshift galaxies, clusters, to really study cluster and galaxy formation. Uh, with something like 3G, we should really improve these samples by an order of, factors of 100 from where we are today is to really probe this high redshift uh, universe. Um, for CMB, I think, you know, we're going to keep on improving these measurements, the CMB polarization power spectrum. Pretty soon, SBT3G will have the constraining power of Planck, but in polarization, uh, to really sort of test uh, their constraints and sort of test models of the early universe if there are continue to be these tensions in CMB versus local probes. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we're trying to build towards this program that has, you know, increases the number of detectors doing these observations by another order of magnitude to really push a lot of these physics-motivated constraints. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh -huh. So, uh, where do you stand in terms of uh, perspectives of improving sensitivity for pixel? Yes, this, uh, this yeah. thing 
Yeah. Yeah, I didn't explain it. I, I normally do, so thanks for that question, actually. So right now, each detector is limited by shot noise, the random arrival time of the photons. So basically, we, you, know, you can't make them any colder. You can't make each detector any more sensitive. And so that's why there's been this evolution in the last 20 years to making more detectors. Like the only way, you can't beat the photon shot noise on an individual pixel level. You just have to make more detectors. So as long as you can, so now, so that's why the challenge has sort of been pushing towards making these larger focal planes, these larger telescope optics designs that can handle more detectors. Because until the you know, last 20 years, we've always been limited by detector sensitivity. Now it's sort of, you need this push towards expanding sensitivity by having more detectors and platforms that allow that. Well, of course, you could do better in space. Yeah, but you know, it's basically the, the yeah. So the, the but it, yeah. but the the background is only about three. You know, ultimately, you always have the CMB background. So it's like a three Kelvin background versus like a ten Kelvin background on the sky. So or on the ground. So roughly, a, a detector in space, you know, is equal to about ten detectors on the ground. So also, so a five hundred thousand uh, element camera on the ground is worth about a fifty thousand detector camera in space. So there's also that sort of cost-benefit analysis. So it helps you a bit, but it's still, you know, if you can do it on the ground. And you, by doing it on the ground, you also can allow those sort of detector advances, fabrication advances, to kind of proceed and sort of drive the design where space, there's also a delay getting it into space. So, you know, time-wise and cost-efficiency-wise, I mean, I th still think the ground makes a lot of sense for this science in particular, but um, there's some advantages going to space. I mean, especially if you're interested in spectral distortions of the CMB or something that really relied on finer measurements of the spectrum, space can make more sense. But if you're, for a lot of these key CMBS4 science goals, it doesn't help. You know, it helps by a factor of 10 per pixel. Well, there. but each pixel in space is a thousand times more expensive right. than a pixel on the ground. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. So I, you're, you're, the fact that it's a factor of 10 better is, may, means that you're better off on the ground. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't, yeah. How similar are your detectors to the X-ray microcolor image? You know? um, well, uh, I mean, one thing that's different is like, uh, you know, we're, we're detecting, you know, something on the order of uh, 100 billion photons per second. So we're still just measuring a total power detector um, in that sense. So, you know, X-rays has a different challenge in that they actually do want to image every X-ray photon and measure the you know integrated energy from that one photon. We're we're just measuring this total power measurement. So that's one big difference. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I meant in terms of I, oh okay. It's there's a, there are a lot of similarities. Um, you know, I think we're uh, you know they you know up to now we've been designing the transitions to be more like a half Kelvin. For the next generation experiments, we're trying to go down to 150 millikelvin detectors, which are very similar to a lot of what the X-ray community is planning. Um, we tend to not need them as fast as X-ray detectors because we're not trying to get this time resolution. So, like even in this design, you can see there's this uh, palladium for extra heat capacity, and that's really there just to slow down the detector. So an X-ray detector would not have that most likely. That they just want as fast a detector as possible to get that better time resolution. But but the, you know a lot of the readout is similar. You know we're we're, one of the technologies for our CMS4 is this microwave multiplexing squid technology, which is what a lot of X-ray people are considering. A lot of the time domain readout that X-ray community is using, we've used for bicep CAC uses that similar technology. So there, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, and then there's also the coupling issue of how it couples the TS is a lot different, where this has so needs some sort of antenna and horn that couples that, where an X-ray detector might have this TS just on the side of an absorber or something like that. So that, that's the difference. So far, you've been exploiting the existing telescope, putting in new detectors, and getting much better sensitivity, but you've still been at one arc minute angular resolution. In the new instruments, is there any improvement on the one arc minute angular resolution? Do you get any new science out of, you know, better than um, It's, it's uh, not, for, for the survey stuff, not really. So there's been some proposals trying to build, you know, build bigger telescopes that have, like, factors of few better angular resolution to go after sort of detailed SZ morphology type science. Um, and so I, I think, like, for that sort of science, I can see where angular resolution makes sense to look for features. But then to zero order, if you're just trying to optimize towards number of clusters and surveying these big areas, as big areas possible, like, you tend not to win to get any better angular resolution in terms of number counts. Like, you just doesn't help with the number of things you find. It just increases your telescope diameter and costs. So, it tends to be that people don't do it when you're trying to optimize a survey, but 
if you're interested in that sort of detailed follow-up with smaller fields of view, then it starts making more but sense. So the next generation telescopes and shows are yeah. comparable angular resolution. Well, so it's, I would, yeah, it's comparable. It, it, this, this thing is a five meter uh, diameter, so SPT only uses about eight meters of its primary. So it's, you do lose about a factor of 1.6 in resolution to this thing. But it's still, so you, you do a li lose a little bit in terms of number of clusters from going from you know, 1.6 arc minutes or 1.5 arc minutes to one, one arc minutes for SPT. Um, but uh, you know, it just becomes a cost issue because you know, this, the tertiary is about as big as the primary. And so having you know, three 10 meter class mirrors rather than three five meter class mirrors, it's just a different, much easier engineering. With this one or oh oh yeah, I know what you're talking about now, yeah. So if you use the um I th I think it ends up basically in the center, like it because it's I mean, right now, the SPT pull constraints in H dot are, you know, plus or minus two versus Planck's, like, you know, factor of a couple at least better. So it basically, you know, where it, uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure with this, the BAO pulls down H dot a little bit. It pulls up sigma, sigma matter a little bit. Uh, but it's, you know, it doesn't move it all the way back either. It's sort of in this weird in-between states. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's basically at some level, you know, what you know, I, what I see as a path forward is we just have to improve the polarization-based uh, constraints and the power spectrum. And for 3G, um, we should actually have better, you know, even independent of Planck, we should have better constraints on these lambda selenium parameters relative to Planck, and, and coming mostly from polarization information. So it, it should be this really strong consistency test at that point with 3G. Right. Yeah, I mean, to, uh, to zeroth order, it's mostly driven by lensing. Like, one of the things we did in this paper was we added this A lens parameter to the fits to try to see, you know, where that went. As, so basically, if, you know, basically as we let A lens be free, to sort of a phenomenological parameter to characterize model lensing in the in the power spectrum, it sort of we drift back to having you know a Planck cosmology but with a low A lens. So it seems like this pull and the SPT pull, pull data is mostly coming from smearing of the peaks at higher L. That looks like a lensing type uh, effect, and you know to zeroth order that seems consistent also with our you know higher order lensing map reconstruction convergent power spectrum where that also is kind of wanting a little, you know, a, a lens of about 0.8 rather than one for Planck. So it's, it, does, it all seems to hang together on the SPT pole side that all our information is driven by lensing that wants a little bit less structure, a little less sigma. But it's still at this sort of two sigma level, so it's hard to say how significant it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll come here in the morning, but then Friday I'm going to go to Harvard at some point. Great, thanks. I'm looking forward to next generation. Oh, I know.